Psalms 20 and 21 tonight as we continue our look at the Psalms. And as we begin, I'll begin reading to you here in Psalm 20 at verse, at verse uh, 1, and I'll read verses 1 through 3, and we'll get into our study. Psalm 20, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. This is a Psalm of David. And David writes, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. Selah. Now, as we look at this, this particular psalm is an example of something we just participated in. This psalm is an example of intercessory prayer. That's what we're seeing in Psalm 20. Now, intercessory prayer is simply a prayer that is made on behalf of somebody else. Though this is a psalm of David in that David penned these words, in reality, this is a prayer that is being prayed for on his behalf, and you'll see that as we go through it. Now, in the Bible, we find various types of prayer. There are prayers of adoration. There are prayers of confession. There are prayers that are called prayers of supplication, prayers of thanksgiving, as well as prayers of intercession. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy, in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, Paul writing, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. There are various kinds of prayer. It's been said that prayer is the lifeblood of the church because it reveals the depth of our relationship with God and it reveals the kind of relationship that we have with Him. We need to understand that prayer is like talking to your mom or talking to your dad, if you will. It's like talking to somebody that you have a very loving relationship with. It isn't something that needs to be formalized. It's something that is conversational. There are some, I believe, who think of prayer in a ritualistic fashion, who think that in order to have their prayers heard, they have to pray in a certain way, and sometimes they might even have a special prayer language, a language that they use. And for some who are raised reading the King James Bible, they might utilize the, the kinds of words that you read in the King James and they pray with flowery King James speech. I believe very strongly that prayer is conversation. It's a conversation with the Lord. And the way that you speak to your friends in terms of the manner of speech, in terms of the words that you choose to use and all, well, I think that you probably should speak in the same fashion to your Father in heaven because He's already heard the way that you speak. Now, of course, we choose our words wisely because we're aware of who we're speaking to when we pray. But the fact is that we're speaking to someone who loves us very much. And so we should speak to that one who loves us. It, it amazes me as I read the Bible that the Bible actually declares to us that God wants us to speak to Him. God actually desires us to take our prayer to Him. If you're taking notes, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8 says, The prayer of the upright is His delight. God actually, in His Word, makes it clear that He wants us to speak to Him. Now, I was thinking of this and trying to find a way of illustrating it because as I think about it, I have to ask the question, why would God care to listen to me anyway? Why would God care to listen to my prayer anyway? Who am I that He should want to listen to me speak to Him? But today, when I came home after spending the afternoon here in the office and all, and I went home to get something to eat and all, my wife Marie met me as I came into the garage and she was carrying my grandson, Josiah. My grandson, Josiah, is seven months old now. And he's starting to recognize my voice. And so she comes walking out into the garage with the baby. And he's looking, and she says, you know, look, Grandpa, look at Josiah. And Josiah, there's Grandpa. And then I look at, uh, I look at Josiah, and I start speaking to him. Hail thou, Josiah. How beest thou this night? No, I say, I say, hey, baby. You know, hi, Joe, baby Joe. You know, and I start speaking to him. 
And then you know what he does now? He's starting, and your mamas remember this, and your dads perhaps can remember when the baby's beginning to hear you make sounds, and then they start trying to make sounds back to you. Now, he's not really saying anything, but you know what? I delight, I delight in hearing his little squeaky voice as he's looking in my direction, saying things that are directed to me. I like that. It, re it makes me remember when my babies were small and they were just learning to say words like, like daddy and, and mama and, and uh, can I have a car? You know, things like that. Um, and learning the word no. Um, there's just something about having a relationship. And so if I can, if I can delight in, in seeing a baby focusing their attention on me trying to make noises that perhaps are directed towards me, I can kind of understand how the Lord delights in hearing us when we speak to Him. And if I then, being an evil father and an evil grandfather by nature, being evil and all needing God, and yet I delight in having them speak to me and I enjoy the times that I have with my children, one of the things that I will always be very blessed with is the reality of the fact that that in, in my life with my kids, we've spent a lot of time talking. My, my children and I have had a lot of conversations. I'm very, very blessed by that, and I am pleased by that. Well, I can apply that in principle to the fact that God says, I delight in speaking to you. Why would he want to speak to you? Because he loves you. That's why. He wants to hear it. He wants to hear our hearts as we communicate. It's not as if he doesn't already know the words before they're even formed on our tongue. There's a certain delight as we open our hearts to Him. Because one of the things about prayer I've discovered is that it reveals my standing with Him, the way that I speak to Him, the things that I say to Him, the requests that I make of Him. All of that reveals my relationship to Him. We're talking about intercessory prayer. Now, we know that Christians understand that because Jesus is the one who taught us some principles of that. Jesus actually prays for us. He intercedes on our behalf. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, speaking of Jesus, the writer said, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Me. He's our intercessor. And so what we see in this particular psalm is an intercessory prayer. Now, you might find it interesting. This is an intercessory prayer that is penned by David but is prayed by a congregation. This isn't David's prayer in particular. He's writing the words of a prayer that were actually prayed on his behalf. This is a prayer that is lifted up by the congregation on behalf of their king. And that's because King David is about to go into battle and his people are praying that he'll be divinely protected. Why would they pray that he would be protected? Well, God's glory was always to be considered whenever Israel went into battle. And Israel has a unique relationship with God, so when they fought, they would know that God was in their midst. And they had a long history of God fighting their battles for them. You might find it interesting, in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, uh, we read, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. And so God is in the midst of the nation of Israel. God's glory and honor is at stake. The king represents God as he goes out into the battle. This is a, what is called a theocracy, God ruling over man. And so David's about to lead the army into battle, and therefore prayer is necessary because God's honor is at stake. God is going to give them victory, and they're praying that He will, because when He gives them victory, it demonstrates His favor on them, and it brings glory to Himself. In Isaiah 37, 20, the Bible says, Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from His hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that You are the Lord, You alone. In other words, God, as You do this, you are going to demonstrate that you are the glorious king over the entire world. So the people pray. Verse 1, they say, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. 
They're saying this to King David as a prayerful blessing and a request to God. Now, I want you to notice how they say in verse 1, May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. When he says, May the name of the God of Jacob defend you, name speaks of God's revealed character as we see it in his word. And God has promised to be our deliverer in time of need. And so when they say, May the name of God, the God of Jacob, defend you, they're saying, May God, because he protects and loves you, may he be your defense. Again in the psalm, Psalm 124, 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So they're saying, may God defend you. Now, when it says here, may the name of the God of Jacob defend you, there's another thing that I'd like to point out, and that is that you have an intimate relationship with him. You know him. You have a relationship with God. In other words, you don't worship a nameless force. You don't worship an unknown God. You know, there's an interesting story found in the New Testament book of Acts. The apostle Paul is in the city of Athens. And the city of Athens during his day was an intellectual center. It was known for its philosophy and learning. And as the apostle Paul was there in the city of Athens, Greece, he was looking around, and as he was looking around, he saw these temples, and there's one particular area of the Parthenon that had a, a multitude of gods, statues dedicated to the gods that they worshipped. And as he was looking there at these various, various statues and the gods that the Greeks worshipped, Paul was inspired to say something, and he did. He spoke to them, and he said this to them in Acts 17, 23. He said, As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. You see, we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so we don't have this kind of prayer life where you kind of throw a prayer up into the sky and say, I hope if there's anybody there that you're listening. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. We have a relationship with God through him. And we know his name, and his name is what we trust in because he has demonstrated his character to us in that he has loved us and sent his son to die on the cross for us. The psalmist, and we saw this earlier in Psalm 9, verse 10, said, those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And so he's saying the name of God is our defense, and we have an intimate knowledge of this God. So in verse 2, he says, may he send you help from the sanctuary, strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. So he's saying to them, interestingly enough, that uh, God wants to have a relationship with you, and may he defend you. May he help you. May he strengthen you. May he remember you, and may he accept you. All of this is a result of receiving David's offerings and sacrifices. Now, when it speaks concerning that in verse 3, may he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices, we need to remember that offerings and sacrifices are the Old Testament way of having a relationship with God. And so they're saying, may you be right before God as you enter into battle. Now, it's important for us to be on God's side. Much more important than to try, him to, try to get him to be on our side. I think that sometimes we, let's see if I can say this properly and briefly. Sometimes we even as a nation can get caught up saying, well, of course God is on our side. Some 83% of all Americans claim to be religious. 83% claim to be Christian. And so naturally, we think that God is on our side. And sometimes, we might even try to get him to be on our side. But there's an interesting thing that I'd like to share with you. It's only going to take a moment to do that. But it's a reminder of something that occurred in the book of Joshua. It's found in chapter 5. See, Joshua was second in command to Moses when Moses, the deliverer, took the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. Well, when uh, the Lord took Moses, Joshua was left in charge. Now, Joshua is leading the armies of Israel, and he's about to go into battle. They're going to be taking the city, the mighty city of Jericho. All of us have heard the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and all of that. Well, he's... He's about to go against the most powerful city as they enter into the promised land. And as they're about to go into battle, he's concerned. And he's taken his concern before the Lord. And it's recorded in the book of Joshua, and I want you to listen to this as I read it. It's recorded in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. It came to pass... 
when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now, you need to put yourself into, into that situation for just a moment. It's more than likely very dark. Joshua is pacing back and forth. Joshua is a military general, a very faith-filled man. And he's concerned about a battle that's about to take place and all the taking of Jericho, even though the Lord is behind it and all. There's still this concern in the back of his mind. And as he's preparing his heart, he looks, and in the darkness, he sees the form. He sees the figure of a man. And this is a man with a sword. He doesn't recognize him. He can't make him out. And so as he's looking at him, as any military man, especially a general like Joshua, he immediately goes to him, and he begins to find out whether he has authority or the right to be where he's at. When I was in the military, we had to pull guard duty. When you pull guard duty, there are certain things that you're supposed to ask intruders. You have to ask who goes there and what authority they have and all of that. They teach you to do that because if the person can't answer the questions, then he's somebody that may be an enemy, and you have to be aware of that. And so Joshua is aware of that. So he approaches him, and he basically asks him a question. Are you for us or for our adversaries? In other words, if you're for our adversaries, then we're going to have it out right now. If you're for us, then I'm going to ask you some other questions to see if you really are. But I want you to hear the answer of this man as he addresses him. When he says, are you for us or our adversaries? He said, no. Now, what does that mean? I mean, that's not the way you answer a question like that. No. What do you mean, no? Well, he says, no. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. Joshua fell on his face of the, uh, to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? He's saying, I'm not on your side, and I'm not on your adversary's side. I'm on God's side. That's the bottom line. You see, it's always better to be on God's side than to try and get him to be on your side. It's always better to be on the side of the Lord. When you're on the side of the Lord, then all the enemies of the Lord become your enemies, but God fights and has victory because they're his enemies, and no enemy can in any way, shape, or form defeat him. And this is what we're seeing here as they're praying, and they're asking that God might work through him. Now in verse 4, may he grant you according to your heart's desire, fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. And so may God grant you according to your heart's desire. David, as you desire to glorify God and to have victory through him, may you succeed. In verse 5, we will rejoice in your salvation. When God answers your prayer, you will demonstrate the answer by having victory in battle. And they're, they are so confident that there will be victory that they're saying, we're going to have banners pro proclaiming your victory prepared. Notice in verse 6, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. So David, you are the king. You are the anointed of God. And we believe that God will preserve you in battle. But you need to remember who gives you the victory. You need to be careful that you don't trust in yourself. You see, that's what he means in verse 6, with the saving strength of his right hand. Don't trust in yourself. Verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses. We will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. The weapons may be advanced and the weapons may be incredible, but my ultimate trust needs to be in the Lord. You know, trusting in chariots and trusting in horses like trusting in tanks and jeeps. You know, these were military weapons during that day. And so they're saying instead of trusting in our own military strength and wisdom, the wisest thing that we can do is trust in the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 33, 16 through 18 says, No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. That's why Paul in the New Testament would say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so the bottom line is, is we need to thank God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying that. Don't trust in chariots. Don't trust in horses. We remember the name of the Lord our God. And then he finally says in verse 9, Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. Instead of trusting in tanks, instead of trusting in infantry, 
we will trust in the Lord. Because horses can be crippled, chariots can be burned, but God cannot be defeated. Therefore, we trust in him, and he will deliver us. Psalm 21. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips, Selah. Now, in this particular psalm, many believe this psalm to be a companion to Psalm 20. They say it may be David's song of gratitude for the victory the people had prayed for. Notice verse 2 here when it says, You have given him his heart's desire. Then remind yourself in chapter 20 or Psalm 20 verse 4 how they had prayed, May he grant you according to your heart's desire. And so there are those who are saying this is a psalm of thanks for the victory that David earned in warfare. Now, as we look at the psalm, the psalm gives praise and glory to God for the blessings that God bestows. And it's a reminder for all of us to be thankful for the many blessings that he gives to us. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the scripture says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And therefore, that's what happens here. David rejoices in God's strength. He rejoiced in God's uh, salvation and his provision because David knows that ultimately he would be nothing and have nothing without him. David knew that military victories were due to God's intervention, and they are also evidences of the strength of God. Notice how it says to us in verse 3, You meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you, and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him, for you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. There's one thing that I would like to, like to share about, and I'm going to take a moment to do this as I change my notes and come to another page. When we look at this picture in verse 3, and I'm going to develop this with you for a moment here, you meet him with the blessings of goodness. It's a picture of God welcoming him back. You're meeting him is a, is a picture of, of David going out battling and returning. And as David returns from the battle, God blesses him. God is actually meeting him. He's greeting him. God is pictured as having gifts awaiting him when he returns. And what is it that he has? Well, when it says you meet him, well, that gives us insight that he receives fellowship with God. God also gives him blessings. God gives him a crown. God gives him long life, and God gives him salvation. I want to talk to you about that for just a moment. Jesus Christ said to us, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life, and that more abundantly. And a lot of people begin to argue amongst themselves or wonder within themselves, what does he mean when he's saying to me that he will give me an abundant life? What is it that he's talking about? An abundant life. Some people would think that an abundant life is, is the accumulation of all the goods and material blessings that I could possibly desire. And, and to be honest with you, very briefly here, I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, I know that God's Word teaches us that He desires to bless us. I have no doubt about that. I don't think that a person who is living in poverty is being specifically blessed more than somebody who has financial wealth. Part of the thing about wealth or poverty, especially wealth, is that the Lord very often has blessed people financially throughout the scriptures, and I don't see it as a greater sin or a great sin at all. Sometimes people do. Sometimes people think that if somebody has wealth or they have finances, that they must have done something illegal to get them and all, and I don't think so. I think that many people that you find in scripture were very wealthy, and they used their wealth for God. I mean, just think about it. Abraham was a very wealthy man. King David was a wealthy man. Solomon was a wealthy man. And you can multiply that many times over. There are many people in Scripture, in the old as well as the new, who had finances. So money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. Money is a tool that is, is, is useful in the hand of a person. God gives something to you. You use it for his glory. God will bless you. And I see that as God is a blessing God. That's the way it is. And David is being promised and thanking God, by the way, for the blessings that he's been receiving from him. David is a king, so he's now wearing a crown. But not only is a king wearing a crown, but he has long life, he has a long and prosperous reign, and many blessings that God is pouring on him. So I am not averse to saying to the Lord, Lord, if you'd like to bless me, I'm more than willing to receive your blessings. But I want to also be capable of receiving whatever it is that you give and to use it for your glory. 
I don't want to hog it for myself. I want to just be somebody who receives things with my hand open so that it can, you know, can, it can be shifted from one hand to another and give it to somebody else. Lord, I don't want to be somebody who looks at materialism as some kind of a, of a um, you know, proof positive that God is working in my life. I've, I've got some things I'll be sharing on Sunday night about this. I have to be careful not to give Sunday night's message right now. But I will say one quick thing, and I have to be careful that I don't give you all of the information. I will tell you this, that in 1970, just talk, talking about materialism, in 1970, and you might find this interesting, in 1970, total credit card debt in the United States, total credit card debt in the United States was $5 billion. Total credit card debt in the United States was $5 billion. Now, yearly, $65 billion is being paid in credit card interest. Credit card interest alone. Total credit card debt in 1970, $5 billion. Credit card interest being paid today, $65 billion. Materialism has taken over the society that we live in to a major thing. So I'm trying to be very careful right now, not saying, giving you an impression that materialism is good. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that God still is a blessing God, and he does bless you as you give to him. He does bless you. And that's what David is extolling uh, as he shares with the Lord. Notice that again in verse 3. You meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you, and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. You have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. Bottom line, Lord, you have given me so many things, but the thing that matters the most to me is you have blessed me with your presence. Now, what is eternal life? If you want a scripture that tells you, it's John 17, verse 3. In the New Testament, John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You know, one of the hardest things to communicate to people is the value of fellowship with God, the value of having a relationship with Him. If I were to waste your time by giving you my testimony, I would tell you one thing. I would say to you that the very first time I ever publicly gave my testimony that I can remember, where I shared it with a group of people, I took a scripture where Jesus said, Now I am alone, and yet I am not alone, for you are with me. And I shared with the people that in my particular testimony, if there was anything that I dealt with as a child, it was a sense of profound loneliness, a sense of being by myself. And without going into a lot of detail that's not necessary, I was the kid who when... I was in school in the first and second grade. I was the kid that you guys might remember on the playground who ate lunch by themselves. I was the kid who was pretty much by themselves all the time. That was who I was. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends. And so I can still remember walking to school by myself, walking home by myself, spending a lot of time just alone. And that was my life for many, many years. So when I was 15, when I started to grow a little bit older, I started to do the alcohol and the drugs and everything like that. And uh, I actually found some friends who wanted to do that kind of thing, too. And that became my friendships. That became my relationships. But in the midst of all the partying and in the midst of all the drug and all the drinking and all the other things that went along with that, there was still a profound sense of loneliness. It was just by myself. I always felt that way until I got saved. And one of the things about getting saved that was, I think, revolutionary for me was the knowledge that I am never alone, never will be alone again. And when Marie, my girlfriend, who became my wife, when we were developing a relationship with her, uh, with each other and all, I was sharing with her, and she doesn't mind me mentioning this to you. And I remember speaking to her, and we were just starting to move towards this idea that maybe, maybe this is going to be beyond friendship, and it's going to go beyond dating for a while. This is going to go somewhere. And I remember sitting with her on one occasion, saying to her, you know, Marie, I need to tell you something, and you need to hear me clearly. You know, you need to know that before there was Marie, there was Jesus. And you need to know that if Marie ever leaves David, there will still be Jesus. He's number one, and you will never be in front of him. And I want that for her. 
I don't want to be her purpose for life. I want Jesus to be. Why am I telling you that? Because this is what I think he's saying in verse 6 when he says, You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. I might have a crown, and I might have long life, and I might have so many benefits and blessings that I can't even enumerate them. But the most important thing in my life is fellowship with God. And that's what God wants with you. God doesn't want to give to you a religious experience. God doesn't want us to get caught up with ritualism, thinking that because we're in a season right now of religiosity and because the movie that The Passion of the Christ is out and people are beginning to awaken at the things that, that, went, that Jesus went through and all, and, and you can actually have a seasonal, and I think that the movie can do that, you can have a seasonal sense of remorse for that. The Lord doesn't want us to be spending all of our time beating ourselves for what we have put Jesus through. What he wants us to know is he did it for us so that we might have life in him. He took upon himself what I deserved. And that graphic portrayal in that movie is portrayed already for us verbally in the word of God. And it takes the Holy Spirit to take that experience of Christ and bring it home to our hearts. And if you could understand, if I could understand tonight that my sins made a separation between God and me, and there was a gulf that separated us called sin. And there was no relationship with him because that sin had made that separation. And so God, in order to take sinful man and join him with a, with a holy God, God did something about that. And what he did is he sent his son, put him on a cross as he stretched forth his arm. He prepares himself to be a bridge. And we cross from sin and that gulf across to Jesus Christ into fellowship. That's what God wants us to know. And it comes through a fellowship with God. So what I rejoice in is the knowledge of God. What I rejoice in is fellowship with Him. What I rejoice in is when I go to bed tonight and I place my head on my pillow, I may be grateful that I have a house. I'm grateful that I have a car to drive home to that house. I'm grateful that I have a bed to put my, my body into and a pillow to place my head on. I'm grateful to have blankets and I'm grateful that if it gets cold, I can turn on a heater. I'm thankful for all of those things. But the thing that I'm most thankful for is that when I close my eyes, I'm with the Lord. When I wake up my eyes, I'm with the Lord. I'm always with Him. I have fellowship with Him. So even if I didn't have a house, if I didn't have a car, if I didn't even have a wife and children, I still have him. And that's the thing that, that I believe that is so important for us. We need to understand that that starts everything. That's the, the point of blessing, and that's where God wants to work through us. So, of course, as he says in verse 6, you have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. We can say, yes, Lord, I agree with that. You have blessed our life with your presence. It says the king in verse 7, trust in the Lord. And through, his, through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. We trust in a merciful God. We depend upon him fully, and God will never let us down. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth, their descendants from among the sons of men. They intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string toward their faces. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. So the enemies of the Lord who are opposing you, he says, will endure terrible judgment. Those who devise evil, those who plot against you, are doomed. Psalm 917 said, The wicked shall be turned into hell, the na and all nations that forget God. So he's saying the Lord's king is the one who rules and reigns and takes care of the Lord's enemies. Now, by the way, the Lord's king is a picture of Israel's Messiah, who we know as Jesus. And no foe can withstand him, and he ultimately will rout those who oppose him. The bow that is pointing towards them reveals his strength and also his sure victory. And we know that ultimately God will deal with those who reject him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. To give you, trouble, you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, no matter how much we preach and how much we pray, there will still be those who, who reject the Lord, and we know it. I have said this before in different ways, but 
But if somebody goes to hell, somebody that I know and somebody I love, they're going to have to cross over a crying, praying body in order to get there. I, wanna, I cry for them and I pray for them and I say, God, in Jesus' name, you need to reach them. I've shared this with you before. God's, God's word is true. God's judgment is sure. And this world that's rejecting the Lord is doomed. That's what the scripture just said, by the way. It has a picture of him. He's pulled his bow back and he's about to let the arrow fly directly at the opponent. And God doesn't miss. And so the point he's making is a very simple one. He's saying, there are those who reject you. They think they're going to get away with it, but they're in your sight. And you're lined up perfectly. And you're going to let that arrow go. And it's going to directly hit its target. When I was in the military, we were trained to fire weapons. And there was, that was something that I had a knack for. I don't know why, but I was a very good shot. I was the best marksman in our company with 160 people. And I was the best, best shot. And I know that when you level on a, on a target and you just concentrate for a moment, it doesn't matter if it's 300 meters, 150 meters, 75 meters. If you level right, you can take it out. Now, I missed occasionally, but Jesus doesn't miss, ever. So if you're lined up in his sight and you're rejecting him, there's no hope for you. That's the point he's making. And he's saying, you have enemies, but your fire will devour them. Not only them, but notice verse 10. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. Why? They intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they're not able to perform. Therefore, you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string towards their faces. They're not going to get away with it, Lord. So we pray for those who don't know the Lord. We're not mad at them. We don't hate them. We pray for them that they might come to God because they're going to stand in, in, in judgment. And finally, when he says in verse 13, Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. Lord, it's just as simple. You deserve our praise, and we sing to you. We know that there is a reward for the righteous. We know that there is a God who judges the earth. And so, Lord, we do ask that we might learn to worship and praise and sing songs of glory to you for what you have done for us. Train us to have hearts of gratitude, for you are worthy to be praised.